There was a kind of tragic inevitability about it. You keep hearing it was London's turn. Then there was the way Londoners cope with the horror and the carnage. More than 50 dead, more than 700 injured. The stoicism, the calm, the very British resolve. But this crisis is far from over. There are still serious questions to be answered and the constant fear it will happen again. In fact, just hours ago, 20,000 people were evacuated from the city centre in Birmingham as Britain remained on high alert. Here's Richard Carlton. This is the epicentre of London. Up there, Lord Nelson, the man who beat the French at the Battle of Trafalgar and set the course of history for the next 100 years. Just 11 days ago, Britain celebrated the 200th anniversary of that victory. Seven days ago, this city saw possibly the biggest peaceful protest ever, Geldof's Live Eight. Four days ago, this city went wild when it was awarded the Olympics for 2012. And the next morning, disaster struck in an arc around this centre point, over by the Tower of London, up by the British Museum, and then over near what might be called the Arab Quarter, Edgware Road. If death toll is the measure, London was not on the scale of 9-11 or even Bali or Madrid, but it is still a disaster of dreadful proportions. And it may be a siren call that Sydney or Melbourne are next. Britain has been expecting this. Uh, 50 deaths or 100 deaths, whatever the final body toll will be, it's an appalling number. People who have no obvious connection with the Al-Qaeda organisation, they've never been through an Al-Qaeda terrorist training camp, for example, they're launching themselves against the West. It's now 72 hours since the attacks. On London's streets, images similar to those of September 11 abound. Look for my friends. After New York, after Bali, after Madrid, London was expected to be a target. But no amount of foreknowledge could prepare anyone for this. Trent, you got off the train at King's Cross, and then what happened? Um, we walked a, a, along the front of King's Cross Station, then we turned left and went down Judge Street. And then as we came down Judge Street, um, we saw the bus there exploded. Trent Mongan is one lucky man. As he fled south from King's Cross, he ran smack bang into another disaster. The Route 30 bus explosion. So when you got to the bus, what did you see? Basically the, the whole back end of the bus had just been annihilated. It had just been ripped open like a Coke can and there was bodies inside and there was bodies on the road and some of them were still sitting in the chairs. There was um, one lady that was still in, in the chair on the bus and yeah, she wasn't, she was dead. And there was still some people standing on the top of the bus trying to get off. Um, and then there was, yeah, people, there was just people everywhere. You survived the King's Cross bomb, you survived the bus bomb, and you had survived one earlier. Uh, Bali, 12th October 2002. Walked out of the Sari Club um, with my then wife, and uh, yeah, the Sari Club and Paddy's Bar blew up behind us. There were four bombs in all, and the first three in the underground railway system went off within seconds of each other at nine minutes before 9 a.m. One was on the circle line between Allgate and Liverpool Street stations. That device was on the floor in the train's third carriage. Another was on the Piccadilly line between Russell Square and King's Cross stations. This is the most difficult and dangerous of the three underground sites. Not all bodies have yet been recovered from here and there is fear that the tunnel may collapse. At almost precisely the same time, a third bomb exploded on a train that had just left Edgware Road heading towards Paddington. When Chris McHugh joined that train at Edgware Road, thank God he chose the front carriage. You were 20 metres from the epicentre of the blast. Yeah, I was in the, the carriage just immediately in front of where the, um, the bomb was in the second carriage. So, so I was damn lucky.
Chris is a Melbourne architect who'd moved here just a few months ago. He says that it was calm in the dimly lit tunnel, even as passengers smashed windows for air and forced open the automatic doors. It took an hour before he got out, picking his way between the train's two rails and the third live electric rail that powers the London Underground. It was awful, actually. It's pretty awful. Um, the some of the sights that I saw down there, I told myself not to try and remember as an image, and I don't think I have, which is nice. I just know that it was was awful. 57 minutes after the three underground explosions, a Route 30 bus was diverted through Tavistock Square because of the explosion at King's Cross. There, in the square, 13 people died. The forensic examination of the bus is difficult because the evidence is spread over a large area. Conversely, the examination of the three underground sites is difficult because the conditions are so atrocious and even now, three days after, an uncertain number of bodies, maybe 20, remain in the King's Cross Tunnel. This will be a painstaking fingertip search through all of those sites to recover evidence. Deputy Chief Constable Andy Trotter is in charge of investigations for the London Transport Police. Is that what's actually going on down there? Your policemen crawling along on their hands and knees? Well, at the moment they're trying to recover the bodies, but while we're doing that, we're very, very conscious of the need to preserve forensic evidence. So the Metropolitan Police anti-terrorist branch working with the body recovery teams are constantly planning and replanning and coordinating their activity to make sure bodies are recovered but at the same time no evidence is lost. The King's Cross Russell Square site beneath here is possibly the deepest point in the whole underground. So deep the trains at Russell Square are only accessed by an elevator. The breakthrough being sought down there now is a fragment of the timing device and the signature of the explosive, both of which may be traceable. That, and a clue to the packaging of the explosive. The police have hundreds of hours of closed circuit television images to examine, and the package had to be carried into the underground at some point. Now this search is urgent because the perpetrators, chuffed by their success so far, may strike again. But we just need that little click that says, that was a little bit unusual, I think I'll tell the police about that. And what we're trying to encourage people to do is give us as much information as possible, no matter how minor it is, no matter how insignificant they may think it is, phone that through to our terrorist hotline, and that might be the little piece of the jigsaw that completes the whole picture for us. The police have acknowledged that each bomb was of the order of five kilos, possibly just a small backpack. They were not crude devices made of fertiliser that you can buy at a hardware store, because for this result, a fertiliser bomb would have had to have been huge. The police have used the term high explosive, and nowadays that usually means plastic explosive. Importantly, the manufacturer is usually identifiable. It is through terrorism that the people that have committed this terrible act express their values. And it's right at this moment that we demonstrate ours. I think we all know what they're trying to do. They're trying to use the slaughter of innocent people to cow us, to frighten us out of doing the things that we want to do, of trying to stop us going about our business as normal as we're entitled to do and they should not and they must not succeed. New York, Madrid, London, can Sydney be far behind? I think it's quite risky to predict where Al-Qaeda or where this type of group might attack next, but certainly we know the sort of targets they're after. Individuals and groups and countries which have supported what's been going on in Iraq, and of course any country that's been involved with, with what's been going on in Afghanistan as well, is going to be a target. Simon uh, Reeve is a writer who's been tracking Al-Qaeda for more than a decade, well before 9-11. 
is it highly likely that these attacks here in London were the work of Al-Qaeda? It's certainly, I think it's highly likely that the attacks in London were the work at the very least of people who would claim to be supporting Osama bin Laden and his way of thinking. Now, Al-Qaeda has really become a, a way of thinking, a state of mind, an ideology. Um, you don't have to know or have met Osama bin Laden to launch yourself on an Al-Qaeda type attack. You just have to have the belief and the commitment in Osama bin Laden's way of thinking. And of course you need the manpower and explosives or weapons. Um, I think Britain has suffered this attack. I think we'll probably discover because Britain is such a close friend with the United States, because our Prime Minister Tony Blair has allied himself whole, completely with, with George Bush. That's the headquarters of MI5 and MI6, Britain's security services. They have almost unfettered powers now and recently were given huge budget increases to stop precisely what's happened. Presumably they'll argue now for more power still, even though some in that building are said to argue that this is simply the price to be paid for standing so squarely behind George Bush. The British intelligence community warned John Howard and this is all in the public record, before the Iraq war started, that if you go into the Iraq war, it will increase the overall terrorist threat, not reduce it. Labor's shadow foreign minister, Kevin Rudd, happened to be in London on parliamentary business. He says there is a clear lesson for Australia. After Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda regard Australia as a target. Iraq may have increased that somewhat. Our challenge as government and opposition, and in fact, across politics in Australia, is to make sure the country is ready. We know that when uh, people do join or when they're sucked in by the, the militant Islamists, they are almost brainwashed. Uh, on the whole, their, their, their backgrounds have been uh, very westernised. They've, they've played an active role in, in what you might call normal western society. They play soccer or they go to bars, for example, and then they're gradually sucked in by, by the militants and all the, all the western part of their lives is cut out. And they become, as I say, almost brainwashed into thinking along the same lines as Osama bin Laden. Islamic communities in western societies now face dangers. Police are guarding London mosques. There's an understandable desire for revenge here, and there's a need for a scapegoat. What serious analysis does suggest is that these London bombings do mark a significant development in the evolution of the Al-Qaeda way of thinking and acting. You could have an organized a, a group or a small number of uh, individuals in London who are plotting and preparing an attack, and you could have a group in Paris, um, just a short train ride away, or a group in Istanbul, or a group in Sydney, and none of them will ever know about each other. Al-Qaeda be then becomes almost like a virus that is infecting people with Osama bin Laden's hatred. Hatred of the West. Hatred of the West, yeah, absolute hatred of the West. A way has to be found to deal with this modern phenomenon. At these times, stirring cries of never negotiate ring loud. But then, even if you wanted to, who would you negotiate with? There's no one person behind this. Hatred of the West is now a philosophy, and that is truly frightening. Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our extra minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.